Hello students, welcome back to the online interactive class on strength of materials. Today, we're going to learn some of the important aspects of elastic behavior and plastic behavior and some elastic limit on this today's class. So the class is divided into three parts. Okay. So in the beginning, we'll have a quick review on our previous class. Then we're going to have a discussion on some of the topics like elasticity, plasticity, and elastic limit. Then we'll turn on to the dealing with some simple problems. Okay. So in the previous class, let's have a quick review. In the previous class, we had an important discussion on concept of stress. So the cells, nothing but we have discussed earlier. Okay, when a body is subjected to any kinds of external agencies, this is said the axis. Okay, so when a body is subjected to any kinds of external agencies like forces, so it offers an internal resistance within this material of the body. So due to the coercive forces which are present in between the molecules. Okay. So this offers a resistance to the action of these external loads. So this induced resistance are developed reactive forces against this applied loads, we call it as the stresses. Okay. In the going to the point of strength, okay. So when a body is loaded by means of some loads are external agencies so it undergoes the deformation or it undergoes the change in size and shape in its dimensionality okay so due to this an action so it undergoes and change in size and shape along the direction of the load okay so the ratio of this change in shape during its loading condition to its its original shape before it was loaded will give the rate of strain or value of strain it has occurred inside the body due to the action of external loads. Then we move on to the next topic of classification of stresses. Okay. So based on the type of forces acting on type different types of material, these stresses are classified into so direct stresses and indirect so coming to the direct stresses, what is mean by the direct stresses is nothing but just take a one simple bar, okay, and assume this is the axis of the bar. So if any loads which are acting in line with this axis of the bar are parallel to the axis of the member okay and its direction is maybe the away or towards the body it depends the type of the force so when an external agency is acting in line with the axis of the members are parallel to the axis of the member then the types of stresses induced stresses induced to these kind of loading conditions is called direct stresses. The stresses are directly induced in the material. So due to the action of tensile force, there will be a tensile stress in, induced in the body. Or due to the action of compressive force, there will be a compressive stresses. There will, if the action of force is shear stress, shear force, uh, the stresses induced is shear stresses. Okay. In the similar way, when we uh, the, some of the examples for this direct stresses we have seen, the tensile so if the direction of this external force is away from the body, then we'll term this as tensile stress. If the direction of this force is acting towards the body, we'll term as compressive forces. Then we have another type of stress called shear stress. So these are the three different types of stresses will come up as the direct stresses we are going to discuss in our particular unit. Then. We have seen what are the types of indirect stresses in, induced in a material. So these are the stresses induced in a materials when the 
action of the forces not in line with the or not in parallel to the axis of the member. For example, take out this condition, say bar, and imagine take this is an axis of the bar. So take an, a load member or an external agency of magnitude P. So this is the line of action, vertical line, and this is the direction downwards, okay, acting on the member. So in this case, the line of action of the force is in perpendicular to the axis of the member. Okay. Take an, another condition, line. So a bar is subjected to a twisting like this. Right. So due to the action of equal and opposite couple. So these two conditions, here the loads are external agencies. Are, acting, are not acting parallel to the axis. The stresses induced due to this condition of loads are the types of stresses induced to these kind of forces are called as indirect type of stresses. So we can observe the, uh, the type of stress induced due to this lateral direction of force. We'll call it as this lateral direction or transverse direction of force acting. So in this case, we can see the bending stresses and then we, in this case, we see the torsional type of stresses. They form the basic examples for indirect stresses. And next, we move on to the uh, topic like discussion on direct stresses, particularly in the unit one. So direct stresses, what are meant by the direct stresses? Individually, one by one, like what is the enzyme stress? What is compressive stress and then what is shear stress? Let's take one tensile stress. Okay. What is mean by this tensile stress? We'll have a quick review on this. So let's take one bar element for this also, one bar member. So before this, I'm gonna have one simple demonstration or an one particular member is there here. So take a look out at this particular member. So this member is spring. So look out my hands. This my hand is trying to tense this away from this load, or this my hand is moving out from this member particularly. So by looking at the direction of my hand, when the force is acting in line and away from the body, or then these are the types of loads or forces which are in contact with the body and they are moving away from the body are called as tensile forces or we will call it as full type of loads or tensile loads or forces. Okay. The material of this member, this spring said, the material of this member opposes this kind of action due to the action of tensile loads. Okay. So this develops a and resistance due to the presence of this coercive forces. Right. So we have seen this in the concept of stress, there will be a induced resistance against to these kind of types of loads. So the stresses induced to these kind of tensile loads is called tensile stresses. Very simple. In a simple word, the resistance obtained by the body against the action of tensile stress, tensile loads is called tensile stresses. The nature of this tensile stress it will tends to increase the length of a body or increase the geometrical length of a member. Okay. So this is an example of our one back stress because its line of action is in line with the axis of the member. Okay. So the same convention for this tensile will take it as positive in general. Okay. So next we'll go to the another type of direct stress called compressive stress okay. here the direction of force acting is uh, towards the body the take the same spring member here my both the hands are trying to pull this member in this direction by looking at my hand direction the loads are acting towards the body they are acting towards the member okay the resistance developing in the member against these kind of loading conditions are called as compressive stresses so with an illustration of this simple bar sketch okay 
So take out this and axis of the bar. So the loads are acting in line with the axis of the bar, right, on either side, and they are the direction of the force is towards the body or towards the lever of magnitude P. Okay. So due to this also, the body or member develops an internal resistance, right? So again, it's this force there will be an internal resistance. So the stresses or resistance developed to these kind of compressive loads are called as compressive stresses. The, and then the nature of this compressive stress is to decrease the length or geometric length of the bar. It will tries to uh, shrink the body or push the body okay, towards its acting direction. Then we can observe here in the, both the cases the corresponding strains are so in the case of tensile stress it undergoes change in length, right? It undergoes the change in length by extending its length, we'll call it a delta L, right? So when we take out this length of the bar is original length before it was loaded, and this is the final length after it was getting extended due to the action of loads. So coming to the strain or tensile strain, so this is a change of length due to the action of external load to the original length before it was loaded. So here the change in length is, so first the final length due to the action of external load minus the original length divided by the original length. So that will give you the extension it has occurred due to the action of these tensile loads. So this ratio will give you the tensile strain epsilon t the due to the action of corresponding tensile stresses. Similar way, when we take out the compressive strain in this case, so due to action of this compressive loads, so the body is going to shorten its in length or it gets compressive or it gets squeezed, okay, length becomes shorter, so this is the change of length we have occurred. So if take this is the original length before it was loaded, right, and this is the final length after loading, okay, the com corresponding compressive strain will be given by the change in length to its original length. So here, the change in length is given by original length minus how much length it is compressed due to the action of these push type of loads divided by its original length. So this ratio will give you the corresponding compressive strain. So you can look out that some of the uh, images we have seen, slide source images, okay. Here we can see, so at this particular, see due to the action of this tensile load, which is moving away from this particular rod, it is tends to increase this length by means of delta L, okay. So this change, this original length of the member and then uh, extension, the ratio of this change in length due to action of this force F to the its original length will give you the induced corresponding tensile strain. Similar way, when look at the compressive stresses, see a body is subjected to compressive force which is acting towards the member and it is try to squeeze the member or shorten its length. So these are the effects of uh, tensile and compressive forces and related tensile and compressive stresses are induced in a members. So next we move on to the another important type of stress, direct stress called shear stress. So these are the types of stresses, third one. 
third example of uh, direct stress is shear stress. So take a one simple block for explanation of this concept with this illustration. Okay, so this is A, B, C, D as we have done in previous class. See, if we made an axis here at this particular section, XX, okay, and the top surface of the block is subjected to one tangential force. To keep in equilibrium, the bottom surface is subjected to an equal resistance, okay. Here, if we take the, so one part, our upper part, we'll call it, um, this is G and this is H, okay. So if you write this in particular sections, so due to the action of this tangential force, the material of this particular part will offer say resistance against this upper tangential force. So this shear stress is usually induced in sliding members or rubbing members. Okay. So when the tangential force applied are parallel to the surface of, of the members, the stresses are reactive forces developed in the member such type of stresses are called as shear stresses. Nothing, nothing but the shear stresses is the shear resistance developed are offered by this particular area. Okay, so that is shear area. So when we look at this in with this illustration. See, this is the initial position of the block. So after it is subjected to tensile force, it will undergo a deformation in its applied direction. Okay. So when we take out the so this displacement or deformation along this applied direction to this vertical height will give you the corresponding shear strain induced due to action of shear stresses. That is the corresponding shear strain. Equal to the displacement occurred in this direction, okay. That is, we'll call it as in transverse direction. So, displacement in transverse direction to its vertical height or distance from its bottom surface will give you the rate of shear strike induced in a material okay so these are the basic three different types of stresses we have discussed in the previous class and later as i said the index stresses okay so we have an example this so the stresses induced due to by any moments or due to any twisting actions such type of stresses are called so indirect stresses the examples as i said in the beginning the bending stress or torsional stress forms the two basic examples as we have seen in the animations okay so next we'll go to the move on to the hooke's law what is hooke's law as i said in the starting of the class so robert hook is an english mathematician he conducted this law so this law states that so stress is proportional to the strain up to some certain limit called elastic limit okay so we know that whenever a body or member subjected to external loading, it will undergo certain deformation. Okay. So whenever, uh, so this deformation is directly proportional to the induced stress in a member up to the elastic limit. That means to say, so stress sigma is directly proportional to strain. So when the stress induces due to the action of more load, the rate of strain are induced or the rate of strain occurred is also increases so then the ratio of stress by strain will give you the equal to a one constant called a uh, proportionality constant so are also called as it is called as moduli of material so this moduli of material is different for different materials and different types of stresses okay So we'll see that in the later one. Okay. So now we'll have one simple experimental demonstration. You're going to understand what is meant by this Hooke's law. Look at this uh, physical uh, experiment setup. Here we have 
so one uh, member r1 force is acting on a spring member see you can the magnitude of force is acting so from 0.5 newton 0.9 newton so similar way we are uh, observing a linear displacement so along its force action direction that is for 2.4 newton we are getting 0.004 meters of displacement 3.7 we are getting 0.006 uh, meters of displacement when we so keep on acting we are uh, raising the load or force on the spring member up to 14.5 it attains 0.022 meters of displacement we plot this spring force and displacement in terms of a graph see it look pans a linear relationship so you can see it here so up to some particular limit the rate of stress induced or the rate of deformation occur will be having a proportionality proportional to each other whenever the stress increases the rate of strain also increases if the induced value of stress decreases the deformation or rate of strain is also becomes less okay so this holds good up to some limit called proportionality limit so thereby we use this principle of hooke's law in uh, up to it will hold good up to the proportionality limit that's why we we can apply this uh, hooke's law principle in linear analysis of designs or stresses and uh, designed by working stress methods we can have a significant role so next we'll see the what is the uh, elastic constant we have three different types of elastic constants okay we're going to see on this one so as i said in the beginning okay uh, and importantly the concept of understanding the direct stresses is very important because we are going to deal the problems on uh, direct stresses or aspects of direct stresses in this particular unit so i hope it's clear now all of you what is mean by the tensile stress and what is mean by the compressive stress so what is the uh, acting force acting direction in tensile compressive and shear stresses okay and corresponding rate of strains are corresponding uh, tensile strain of compressive strain and shear strains induced in a materials okay from the hooke's law so it is concluded that uh, the ratio of shear st stress to corresponding strain is constant up to some limit called proportionality limit so in case of it is direct stresses or normal stresses whether it is a tensile or a compressive we'll call it as, as a, a modulus of elastic elasticity the constant proportionality constant is termed as modulus of elasticity or ings modulus so it is denoted by the letter e here so the ratio of stress to strain is equal to constant in case of direct stresses it is the moduli of material is termed as elastic constant it is expressed in usually newton per meter square so in case of shear stresses the ratio of shear stress to corresponding shear strain is equal to a constant value that constant is termed as modulus of rigidity or shear modulus shear moduli it is denoted by the letter so g in sometimes c also we can represent the shear modulus so in case of volumetric distortion due to the action of uh, direct stresses so on the members the ratio of this direct stress to the corresponding volumetric strain is equal to one constant and this constant is termed as the bulk modulus so these three the modulus of elasticity are ings modulus and uh, shear modulus and bulk modulus will form the three elastic constants of a materials so this helps in understanding the elastic behavior of materials under the uh, conditions of loading next we'll move on to the or uh, today's topics like elasticity okay so first we'll see the what is meant by the elasticity okay so we know that every material will undergoes deformation or it will undergoes some change in size or shape in its dimensions due to the action of external loads 
so whenever we remove the external loads from that bodies or members so it will regains back it will regains back its original size and shape after the removal of that external loads so this kind of nature of a materials is called elastic elasticity of a material so so this elasticity will be applicable up to some certain limit so within that particular limit okay the members or bodies it will, will come back to its original size and shape in its dimension after removal of the external loads in a simple words it is an mechanical property it is an important mechanical property of materials by virtue of which regains its original size and shape without any fracture or without failure after removal of external loads so you can see this some animation here so it, it is compressed due to external force or by means of anything after removal of it will regaining back its to original position see here in this case also the rubber is expanded so after removal of the expansion it will coming back to its original position or size and shape so usually all the materials will possess some elasticity up to some limit including glass also okay it is an important property or uh, uh, in finding the strength of different materials usually uh, elastomers and uh, some of the uh, polymers like uh, natural or synthetic rubbers will be having a more elastic in nature so coming to that elastic limit what is meant by elastic limit just now we have discussed that okay so the material uh, whenever it is undergoes or subjected to loading it will undergoes the deformation so after removal of the particular load it will come back to its original position so this kind or this nature is limited to some certain limit or some particular value so beyond that value or beyond that limit if we further increase the load or if we further uh, increase the rate of stress induced then the deformation occur due to that value of stress will not be coming back to its original size and shape it retains it will goes to the plastic state or it will retains its uh, deformation permanently so this limit the maximum limit up to which the material regains its original size and shape after the removal of load is called as elastic limit so elastic limit will be differ for different materials and uh, different types of stresses okay so next we'll go to the plasticity another important property of a member or materials you can see this we know that so when a member is subjected to loading so it will occur the deformation this deformation or induced stresses completely vanished after removal of the load within that elastic limit when we further increasing the loading condition of a member so it induces more stresses in the body that leads to occur more rate of strain in the member so beyond that particular elastic limit so the material sets to a one permanent deformation that means so even after the removal of the load also it will not come back to its original position see in the cases here the first the bar rest by two pins okay uh, so it is loaded by some vertical downward force in the figure 1 so in the figure 2 it is undergone some deformation some deformation is occurred some deformation function of the load of the the third case you can see that there is some permanent set there is some residual strain completely set even after the load is removed so this state of or this nature of a materials is called as plasticity or plastic nature of materials okay so that is it is also one of the important property in finding in determining the strength of materials by virtue of which it will undergoes a permanent deformation without fracture even after the removal of external load that means even we remove the external loads from the body also it doesn't regains its original size and shape 
so some of the examples for this plastic materials are uh, you can take uh, rocks soil and uh, uh, cements are the will form the basic uh, we come across in our daily life in, as a examples for plastic materials so these two uh, properties like like elasticity and the plasticity and elastic limits will uh, play a prime role in uh, determining the strength of any materials we use it in our uh, various structures okay so in the next we'll move on to the some important dealing with some basic uh, problems related to the direct stresses okay so before we going to that just take an important expressions what we have come across in this particular topics of direct stresses so before we deal with the problems okay so it is uh, better to Uh, remember some of the mathematical expressions which we use it in solving the problems okay so uh, while solving the problems we should analyze the concepts or realize the concept what you have learned what is mean by the uh, stress induced rate or the rate of deformation occurred while it is subjected to different kinds of loads okay so you can come along with me so by writing some important formula before we commence with the problems first one is the stress are direct stresses or normal stresses okay it is given by sigma whether it is tensile or compressive okay depends on uh, the direction of the load acting So this is given by sigma t or sigma c, so which is equal to p by a. So where in this is stress is expressed in newton per meter square. So where this p is load acting or external load. Area is A is the cross-sectional area of the member. So in meter. The second one is uh, we'll go to the shear stresses. So sigma S, or we can write as in tau. Shear stresses are denoted by so shear resistance by shear area. So this is P by pi. So next we have a uh, proportionality constant or modulus of material. For this direct stresses, that is, modulus of elasticity or elastic constant, according to Hooke's law, E is equal to so stress by time. So this ratio is constant, so within elastic limit. So another important formula. So whenever The material undergoes tensile or compressive, so it will uh, subject to some deformation. So that deformation are in terms of elongation, 
or whether it is increase in length or decrease in length. So this delta L can be calculated by this mathematical expression, which is P L by A E, where so we know that P is load applied Newton. So this is in meter, millimeters, or meters. The so shear stress also expressed in Newton per meter square. And uh, L is length of member or body. And here is the area of cross section or cross sectional area. Square and is the in smaller are elastic constant, which is in even per meter square. So these are the some important expressions we have come across in uh, dealing with problems related to direct stresses. So next we're going to see some uh, conversions and uh, units. So we use our in dealing the problems. So let's take this part. The first is we use length, so in meters in SI units, okay. So we know that one meter is equal to 10 power 3 times millimeters, and then so on symbol is small l or capital L, we'll use next diameter. So small d. So this is also in meter. The same one meter is equal to and for three times millimeter. When we come to the area, so a. So this is a meter square. Our one meter square is ten for three times millimeter. So ten for six times millimeter square. So then. We go to the load P. So in Newton, we have 1 kilo Newton equal to 10 power 3 times Newton. So when mega Newton is equal to 10 power 6 times Newton, we use it in conversions. The fifth one is the stress sigma, the diag stress or tensile compressive. So this is in for meter square Pascal. And Pascal is equal to one newton per meter square. This is an important conversion. So one Pascal is equal to one newton per meter square. One uh, one kilo Pascal is ten power three times Pascal or ten power three times one per meter square. Similarly. Mega mass is equal to so 10 times 10 to the power of 6 times Pascal, okay, or 10 to the power of 6 times Newton per So you are saying, say, say uh, 10 to the power 6, when we convert this new meter square is equal to millimeter square, when we take out Newton into 10 to the power, so meter square is equal to we have 10 to the power 6. Okay, so mm square, 1 meter square is equal to 10 power 6 millimeter square. So these two will get cancelled, so it forms Newton per mm square. That means 1 mega Pascal is equal to 1 Newton per mm square. That's right. Okay. So similar way, so 1 giga Pascal is equal to right, 10 power 9 times of Pascal. Uh, so 10 power 3 to 1 newton per millimeter. 
So these are the important conversions. This plays an important role in solving the problems without any mistakes. And one important suggestion is when you uh, express the uh, units, so it has to be in same either in meter square, either in millimeter square. So for example, if the Young's modulus is given in uh, Newton per millimeter square, so the area I have to calculate the length of the substitute should be in millimeter or millimeter square, and the stress, the value you can substitute in the expression should be in Newton per millimeter square. So all the parameters we use, we have to use it in same, uh, in the same system, okay, either in Newton or in Newton per meter square. So either in Newton millimeter or Newton per millimeter square. So next we'll take one simple problem like on direct stresses. Okay, this is a very simple problem. So you have to solve when if you are understood the concepts well. So just have a look at the data they have given. A circular rod of diameter 16 mm, so and uh, 5. 500 millimeter long is subjected to a tensile force of 40 kilo newton. So here uh, we have to write other two terms like elongation. I have written already here. So is equal to delta L is equal to P L by A E. So this is in millimeters. R will convert into meters, and then Young's modulus. E is equal to Young's modulus or elastic constant. So this is also in Newton per meter square. So the same conversions like uh, stress. So Newton per meter square or one megapascal is equal to ten power six Newton per so meter square or one Newton per millimeter square. We can use it. Okay. So let's say let's take a look on this particular data they have given in finding the direct stresses. A circular rod of diameter 16 mm and 500 mm long is subjected to a tensile force of 40 kN. The modulus of elasticity for steel may be taken as 200 kN per millimeter square. So find the stress, strain and the elongation of the bar due to applied loads. So in solving the uh, problems, we have to approach in different ways. Like first, we have to read the data carefully without any mistakes. We have to collect the data, what are the details they have given. And then the second thing, we have to identify what is our task, what we have to determine exactly. Then we can use the methodology. So which formula shoots the given data in finding the unknown value or the uh, in finding the target. Our task okay so in this particular problem we can say this uh, we can take a simple sketch based on the data we have given So this is one steel bar we have, it has to be there for solving the problem, you can understand when. See this one circular rod, okay, to we'll take this one rod. So this of uh, having a diameter of 16 mm. So diameter 16 mm and a length of 500 millimeters. Okay. So next, what they have given? They have given the type of force is tensile force. So here uh, they have given the material also. First, we'll write this the type of force. So say this is an axis, of this rod. So the, the tensile force acting will act towards the uh, I mean away from the body. Sorry, the tensile force will act away from the body. They have given the magnitude. This is in line with the axis, and the direction of the force is 
away from the body. So they, they have not given any boundary conditions, whether it is fixed or one side or not like that. Okay, we can apply the tensile for on, force on both the sides. Okay. So the direction is moving away. So they have given the magnitude T is equal to so 14 kilometers. And then uh, the type of material the steel rod is made of. We have mentioned that it is the material used is steel. Okay, this is also important. And then it is having an elastic constant E is equal to so 200 kilogram per millimeter square. So this is the one simple imagination we can uh, have or we can just sort it out by giving uh, by knowing the given data. Okay, let's find out uh, which is the most suitable formula for finding the stress and uh, strain and elongation. So we have this uh, data like our load is there of 40 kilonewton. We'll convert that into newtons, 40 into 10 power three times newton. And then in modulus they have given okay so from kilo to uh, newton per millimeter square you can convert 200 kilo newton per meter millimeter square is there so 200 into 10 power three times newton per millimeter square so yeah they have given length of 500 millimeter itself so so we'll plot that then diameter of the rod d is equal to 16 mm so everything is in millimeters both diameter length so you have to look out this in small less. This is in kilonewton per millimeter square. That means you have to express the length and the diameter and area should be in millimeter square. Either you can convert this to newton per meter square like that. So it has to be expressed in the same way. So first what we have to do, so in finding the stress or determining the stress, by using this diameter of the rod, we can calculate this area. So area of the rod, given by 5 by 4 times d square, right? So 5 by 4 times diameter is 60 square. So it will give you the area of cross section of the member, which is resisting the load. So that is given it has 201.06. The diameter is in millimeter. So the area is in millimeter square. OK. So next, look at the uh, formulas, OK? So how means we can find out the stress. We have the load and we have the value of area. Then simply we can use the stress is equal to P by A. So here the stress or uh, reduced stress, whether it is because the load acting is the tensile load, the stress induced to this action are the stresses which is opposing this action is tensile stresses in this case. The types of stress, stresses induced are tensors in nature, which is given by P by A. So you can substitute the value of P, they, they have given the 40 kilonewton and the area of pass section, so 201.06. So thereby we'll get an value of induced stress 198.94 newton per millimeter square. So this is the area we got here. And then by substituting the uh, value of load P, sorry, this is, and uh, area of 201.06, we'll get an uh, intensity of stress induced due to this action of 40 kilonewton across an area of cross section of 201.06 millimeter square. The value of stress induced is 198.94 newton per millimeter square that one you have to realize so from the basics uh, fund fundamentals or understandings what you have learnt in the from the beginning of the class so next we, we have to determine the strain also so we know the formula of Hooke's law so the stress is directly proportional to strain that is the stress by strain is equal to elastic constant so by rearranging that right so this formula So the according to Hooke's law, 
modulus of material is equal to stress by pi. Okay. So we have a stress value and we have a elastic moduli value. The only one parameter is left unknown. So we can so reuse this or rewrite this formula into strain. So in this case, the tensile strain due to the action of tensile loads given by a sigma by e, the ratio of stress to elastic modulus. So substitute these values in this particular expression. So stress we got around 198.94 newton per millimeter square and we have an inch modulus of given so 200 into 10 power 3 times newton per millimeter square. So here many of the students will make in substituting the parameters in terms of units. So here the load should be in or sorry the stress should be in newton per millimeter square and the value of elasticity also in newton per millimeter square. You have to uh, concentrate bit while substituting the values. So we will get a strain rate of, of around uh, 0 0.000947. Okay. So due to this action of uh, 40 kN across an area of 201.06 mm square, so there will be an intensity of induced stress of 198.94 newton per millimeter square due to the these actions a strain rate of 0.00947. Okay. The next uh, uh, parameter we have to calculate is the elongation. So it is given by the direct formula PL by A. E. So we know the all the values. Okay. So P the load we know and L is the length of the rod and A is the area of the cross section is the Young's modulus. Substituting all these values, we can get 0.497 times millimeter of elongation that means so the member will undergo the change in length okay. so due to this action of tensile loads so this change in length or elongation it is occurred in this condition is 0.497 okay. so we can calculate uh, by other means also the value of this elongation so we know that in a simple way so the ratio of uh, the strain definition of strain is given by the change in length to virginal length okay we can use this expression also so we have to calculate this change in length or elongation so we have the strain value and we have the original length of a rod. So by rewriting this, the change in length of elongation is given by strain into length. The strain induced, we got here 0 0.000947 into length of the rod is 500 millimeters. So this is, will give you the, the same answer like uh, elongation what we got from the using formula of PL by AE that is point uh, it is I think four nine seven times millimeter same so both the methods are same you can use the uh, simplest one which you feel better I hope you understand this uh, particular problem and you can solve these kind of problems based on direct stresses okay so that means you have to realize here so for uh, inducing the value of stress of uh, 198.94 newton per millimeter square so it is requiring a load of 40 kilo newton it has acting on uh, 201.06 times of millimeter square area with a material of steel and having an inks modulus of 200 into 10 power 3 times newton per millimeter square for these conditions okay for this applied load and for this given modulus of elasticity so acting on this particular cross-sectional area so we'll get an value of this intensity of stress so thereby we can decide so for which magnitude of load what is the rate of stress induced and uh, what is the deformation it is occurred due to this induced stress and due to this action load whether it is in safe margin or not and uh, what is the maximum load it can withstand okay and what is the failure load which affects the failure of a uh, structure or member 
so you can estimate all these things by dealing the aspects like this okay so next we'll go to the another uh, problem okay i'll conclude it so in one simple problem similar to this previous one so this is in terms of compressive load okay here we have one steel column is around 120 mm in dia and 3 meters long so you have to find the intensity of stress and the strain when it carries an axial compressive load of 950 kN so take the uh, ings modulus or modulus of elasticity is equal to 2 into 10 raised to 5 newton per millimeter square so from this data so first we have to collect the whatever the given details so they have given the diameter of 120 mm and length of 3 meters will convert to millimeters then ings modulus they have given it as in newton per millimeter square only then applying external load and compressive type of load of 950 kN so first by using this diameter we will calculate an area of the cross section of the steel column okay so right as it is sketch for this condition also this one steel column is there so take out okay, made up of steel material right so this is uh, having an 120 meter dia and length of Three meters, that is three into ten power three times millimeters, and this is applied by a uh, compressive load of nine fifty kilonewton. So this steel column is subjected to a compressive load. See the direction is towards the body. Okay, so this is of magnitude they have given nine fifty kilonewton. is equal to 15 to 10 power 3 times newton and the elastic constant is equal to 2 into 10 by 5 newton per millimeter square so this is the nature of the problem the conditions they have given so for this the first we have to calculate the area of cross section which is resisting this particular load that is given by so area is 5 by 4 times diameter square So five by four into diameter is one twenty. We'll substitute the values. We'll get the area of eleven thousand three hundred nine point seven six millimeter square. So then, after the area by using the load applied and the area of cross section, we can calculate the compressive stress induced in steel column due to this action of nine fifty kilonewton. Then we can determine easily the rate of intensity of strain that is by dividing. Stress by Ings modulus, both are given in the problem. So thereby we can evaluate or estimate the rate of stresses, compressive stresses induced due to the action of compressive loads, okay, and the intensity of strain in this particular case. Okay, I hope it's clear now the concept of stress and the basic types of direct stresses and indirect. What is the mean by the indirect stresses? And what is the nature of tensile compressive under? shear stresses and then uh, we talked about uh, elasticity plasticity and elastic constant concepts okay and then we have seen the hooks law and demonstration by means of one experimental setup in the today's class okay so i hope you all uh, understood this concepts well and uh, you can ask your questions at the end of this session and uh, thanks for your attention